is that has to start it. And it's a protocol, it's a French protocol. Uh, we have four presentations today for this uh, industrial work workshop. Uh, we have one presenter that we don't know where, where is it, but I'm sure we'll find you an at the time. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, Judith that uh, we talk uh, about uh, 3D uh, image conversion on photo on 3D web building, 3D web building. After we have Michael that we talk about 3D and web semantic for interior design. I suppose we will have Johannes Berner that will present uh, visualization infrastructure for industrial application. And I will finish with a short presentation, possible very short, I don't so uh, of uh, the vision of EDF and the work on uh, multidimensional browsing inside the engineering data. So, should it? So good morning everyone. I'm Judith, I'm from Dennis Gabor College, Budapest, Hungary. And uh, today I will um, be talking about um, a different uh, concept, a different idea for uh, 3D on the web. If only it worked. started a project in, back in 2012. I'm sorry, I'm technically impaired at the moment. back in uh, 2012 as a collaboration between Dennis Gower College and a research institute of uh, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. My colleagues tested uh, mostly, mostly all of uh, the available technology for uh, 3D displays and uh, stereoscopy for the web. They wanted to bring uh, actual uh, 3D display technology to, to the web. And uh, they were doing a territory job with uh, all the text-based and non-image-based content. So they were doing all the, all the great website. However, they uh, were still using graphic designers for uh, the conversion of images. And you can imagine that it's just... Uh, it just takes a long time and you need specific manpower. So they were looking for a way to automate it which is uh, how I came into the project. We have uh, actually a tie to, to CREED. We, as, a, well, as an international collaboration between uh, Dennis Gabor College and the TE of CREED, we <coughs> did a 3D website for their, their huge project based as this. And I can only speak for the images, they will look something like this. So because uh, the analytic technology was uh, the cheapest and most widely available, the project leaders decided that uh, this is the technology that uh, they're going um, to move forward with. They have tested, uh, they have tested uh, polarized glasses, shutter glasses, but it turned out that uh, the technology was just not uh, widely spread enough and it was just not available for so many people as, as Enigma it was. So my job was to, to create a way, a method, to automate uh, 3D conversion of images. 
So I come from uh, the 3D graphics background. So it was uh, my first idea to do a representation with a Z map. And you know, it's easy when you have a 3D scene, it's, uh, it's really easy to, to get a Z map out of it. But when uh, you have an image and you want to do the reverse, it's, uh, it's, it's not that easy, it's not that trivial. However, if uh, I have a Z map, then I will have the, just the tiny tool that I can, I can my possibly need for, for 3D creation. So the problem was that uh, I had to reverse engineer an enti entire third dimension with uh, just about no information to, to be a basis of it. So we decided to come up with uh, certain guidelines. We decided that those objects that uh, received more light were likely to be closer to the camera, and uh, those objects that were in the camera's focus were also more likely to be closer. This technique works for, um, for most normal images that you would find on the web, or uh, mostly anything that you would find on a news website. It uh, does not work for artistic images or images with a, a twisted perspective, obviously. So, I'm not sure you can see many <laughs> much on a projector, but um, this is uh, one of the resulting images. Or, well, it's a test image and the resulting estimation of uh, Zena. And uh, this allowed me to turn this image into these uh, stereoscopic images. It also works with uh, previous 3D renderings. And uh, the result is not bad, I think. So let me just uh, briefly introduce you to the steps of uh, the actual reconstruction. So first, uh, the, the algorithm has to make uh, some, sign, uh, some kind of sense of, of the image. So I use the measure segmentation to, to come up with, uh, with the different areas different regions in the image. Then, well again, you have to believe me, it's a grayscale image. I just applied a brightness formula, sorry for the math, I applied a brightness formula for, uh, for the segmented image, and uh, that gave me a depth estimation for, um, for the brightness. Then, to gather focus information, I uh, used a module developed by the Academy of Sciences. And if you use a specific linear combination of these two, then you get the final estimation of uh, a depth map. It's, um, it's not always 100% accurate, but the goal was to give the user a special experience. And it turns out that um, the depth map is um, it's accurate enough to to result in an image that was uh, believable to to the user. So when uh, I had this depth map, all I had to do was apply uh, parallax shifting of uh, the different different areas, different regions, and that gave me this very nice image. And you can see the, the problems that, uh, that uh, a whole uh, dimension generation leaves us with. So there are areas with all the missing information that you just don't have because you had one single image at the beginning. So to, to reconstruct these uh, areas, I came up with a, a new technique. I uh, combined a simple uh, von Neumann stencil with uh, the idea of uh, ray tracing. So von Neumann stencil basically takes the neighboring pixels of a pixel and uh, computes uh, some, some other factor, some other value based on that. But you see the point when I want to reconstruct a pixel value about right here then all of its neighboring pixels will be just as blank. So I'm left with no extra information. However, 
if I uh, <coughs> if I just send out a ray in one direction, and if that finds me the edge of uh, of the hole, finds me the first non-blank pixel, then that pixel will be the closest neighbor to my original pixel in that direction. So if instead of Instead of taking the exact neighboring pixels, I take the first pixel that uh, is uh, that is out of out of the blank area. That will give me the most uh, relevant data, the most relevant information that I can base uh, the reconstruction upon. So after gathering all that data, what do I do with it? I just run it through a filtering kernel. To, to get the final, final result. We have experimented with uh, many filtering kernels. First, we had the idea that wouldn't it be great if a simple averaging process would do the trick? It would be fast, incredibly fast. But um, you can see that it, it's clearly not a very good experience to look at this. Then I had another idea. What if I um, applied something like uh, the linear interpolation and uh, took uh, the distance of uh, the pixel into account? Well, it turned out that um, distance was uh, not too relevant after all when combined with an averaging process. So the averaging process took away more than uh, the distance actually gave to the mix. So then I decided to, well, um, not, so be, not be so cheap on computation and maybe use a little more computational power and uh, more computational time. And I turned to the good old medium filtering, which uh, usually solves a lot of problems. And you can see that the result is uh, really realistic. I think that's because um, Every pixel that is chosen is uh, already a value that's, uh, that's present in the image, in the, um, in the vicinity of, uh, of the blank area that was reconstructed. So, just to show you the, the starting image and then the resulting, resulting stereoscopic image. From there, you can uh, code it to any wave, you can use it on an autostereoscopic screen. Also, you can, of course, use it with a shutter glass or with polarized glasses. That all depends on the display technology. And it bring, brings me to my references. And that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions? Not, not questions for the presentation, but I'm wondering if you brought some examples that we could see on your screen later on. Later on, yeah, I do have some on my laptop. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Nicholas? Uh, I'm curious, um, do you uh, assume a certain um, inter-eye uh, distance, or, or how do you need to know that to compute the stereo? Yes, you do. There's a um, there's formula for a parallax conversion. You can, uh, you can decide where, whether you want uh, a smaller angle or a, or a larger angle, or if you, you can also specify how, um, how far the max distance from the plane of, uh, of the screen should be. So, yeah, is the idea sort of to pick a Six centimeters or a human average, and just do a whole bunch of flicker photos or something? Yeah, basically. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. Are you making your contents only for the website or other, other fields? Right now, it's only for a website. It's optimized for a website. And uh, I should tell you that it's only it's a prototype at the moment. So, so you're not deployed yet? You, you're we use it at, at the university, but it's a, it's a technology that's uh, available wider. If you're interested, I can 
I can uh, put you in contact with uh, with my leaders. We are interested. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been part of the DECO project funded by IDEVS3 uh, program uh, for support of uh, research groups in uh, uh, universities. The main idea has, has been to apply to automate aesthetical application for uh, houses, for homes. That is, we try to automate uh, a real use case. Uh, so that uh, people would to see how uh, uh, aesthetic uh, choices would differentiate their room. Provided with that, they had a model of their room. So, since uh, it, it, it seems uh, suitable and doable because it is XML, and we can exploit some relevant technologies that I'm going to talk to you about. So, in order not to assume the indirect approach, an exhaustive approach, we would need uh, some semantic description for, uh, for our space that is a sufficient vocabulary. Uh, we would like uh, to have uh, classes of objects uh, which uh, would be described by their attributes and their properties uh, and the relationships among them. So, if we had such a uh, meta description, a semantic description, we would uh, then uh, could apply rules in terms of uh, a description language that. Uh, would give us the opportunity to construct queries, random, and get meaningful answers that could, we could transform them to uh, 3D uh, scenes. So, resource description for the web can be achieved through uh, RDF, which is part of the specification uh, and uh, it uses it takes advantage of the idea of triples that can be used to describe uh, resources in general because the web is about resources and their relationship it only requires three uh, uh, pieces of information uh, for a resource you can uh, Specify it's an attribute and, and, and the, the respective value. So this resource is linked to the respective value uh, via its property, and thus, thus a relationship is formed. This, of course, is ex expressing in uh, the respective format here. So that's a little bit about. RDF, which is very key to this application. Um, so, in order to exploit RDF, we need to apply to define the actual types, properties, and the uh, relationship um, among the uh, objects we will be using. The web ontology language is very helpful uh, for this. It is also a WTC specification on top of the uh, idea. Uh, it is designed for the web, uh, obviously, uh, and it uh, offers different de degrees of expressiveness. Uh, 
there are three types of uh, our ontologies like real and full, and uh, it is convenient. It is convenient for different uh, type of uh, applications. Uh, in, uh, in regard to the, the degree of exp expressiveness you uh, you wish. So I see that uh, we have a problem uh, with the slide. It uh, goes beyond uh, the, the screen. So uh, I'll try to make you skip. So. For our purposes, we construct, constructed an uh, ontology uh, that covers the needs of interior spaces. Uh, we, uh, uh, with us, uh, defined uh, three, four uh, types, uh, classes of objects that uh, refer to content. We can see the the ontology on the, uh, on the, on the right. Uh, content uh, includes uh, furniture, uh, any other object uh, we can use uh, for uh, our interior space. We also define data types candidates, uh, that is abstract characteristics for objects, anything that uh, can be attributed to them. And we can use, of course, to to refer uh, uh, and to apply uh, aesthetic rules on. Uh, the, the, the main class, uh, or the main class, which uh, is the type of, which, which characterizes the, the room, whether it is a living room or a, bed, a bedroom. And the structural class that defines immovable objects, uh, like walls, uh, and then there are the object properties. I'm not sure that you can see it very good. Uh, anyway, an object may have a mood, a style, uh, a color range associated with the grid, uh, functionality uh, related to it, material, origin, and so on. Theme may be behind of another object, in front of another object, and so on. So, uh, since uh, RDF uh, by design uh, can be represented uh, as a graph, each uh, individual uh, of our scene can be seen to be a, a graph, uh, such a graph. If it's a furniture, for example, and it has an image, uh, here is the, the triple that uh, characterizes the, this relationship. It, it has 3D object. This is the respective uh, uh, relationship. It could be, of course, behind another furniture, a table, which would have another image. And so you can see that uh, this would be expanding in case of uh, an interior space. And uh, a big tree of meta information uh, will be uh, created for each uh, scene. So we we had to uh, to overcome some problems in order to define properties uh, that can't, couldn't be attributed to to data type properties, but only to object properties. So this would be the. Uh, <laughs> the graph of, uh, of our ontology. Uh, I don't know if we can zoom in uh, here. Ah. Okay. It's a little too big for for uh, the, the screen. I don't know if you can read. This is a room. The room, the class that represents the room. This represents the uh, content. Uh, if you could uh, read <laughs> uh, uh, the, the boxes, the, these shapes, 
these are uh, furnitures, that type of furnitures. Uh, these are um, I could try to open it in another program. Uh, could we open uh, the MS Paint uh, copy paste the image? I do. Uh, uh, it's Windows 8, by the way. And it's in French too. So my hands are tight. That's better. Thank you. Oh, I'll use the mouse. Oh, it has a touch. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yes. It's so, the biggest problem in life. It's computers. So the room has a structural elements ceiling, walls, stairs, floors, etc. It also has uh, properties uh, that data type candidates, we call them, uh, major functionality, minor functionality, luminosity, object type, all, all the properties I mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in the previous slides. And uh, this uh, graph shows the relationship. So it is expected to be a little bit. Oh, yes. So we implemented uh, a case. This work is uh, uh, under development. It's not uh, finished yet. We're continuing to we're continuing to involve it, but it's not finished. But uh, the the use case is uh, it's, uh, it goes a little bit like this. Uh, the user selects uh, items or objects from uh, our ontology. Uh, they are X3D objects and uh, they drag and drop them in a canvas. So they, they form uh, the, the how the room looks from above. I don't remember how you call it. So they decide about it. they decide about uh, the arrangement of the uh, of the items and then they transform it to X3D. After that, uh, this is an, uh, the XSLT transform that uh, that transforms the SVG this SVG to X3D, of course. We know the dimensions, everything. we know the position, we know the spatial information from the object, so it is easy to, to construct one from the other. And after that, we, uh, we can uh, apply the rules. Oh, oh, of course, uh, users have, are free to, to select the color of uh, each item, uh, each, uh, their position, their rotation, their state. So they have, they have given us their preferences. So the next step, which is also the, the goal, is to apply uh, the semantic web rule language um, in order to find the associations and uh, propose uh, solutions. So this. Uh, this language goes like this. It, it, it can express relationships. You can see this example in uh, individual X1 uh, as uh, 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 X2 as his parent, and uh, X2 has a, has a brother, X3, then you know, enter this, this rule that produces the result that X1 has uh, X3 has an angle. This is a true statement uh, that uh, 
that is produced. So, rules are run by reasoners, such as the pellet reasoner, which we can use. And uh, we have been asked, maybe I, I can reduce the, the forms. This is the fault uh, uh, of, the mic of Microsoft. They are never uh, fully compatible. Huh? Yes, yes. I know. <laughs> so, so it may be a little bit difficult to read. So, but this is the, the main idea. We construct queries such as this one. Uh, if there is a room that has an individual x1 room uh, that has x2 a, a, a piece of furniture, uh, and x3 is the floor, and the floor has this specific color or this color uh, yes this specific color and uh, this uh, type of this color range then you can uh, return the view returns that uh, x1 must take this specific uh, style or it must it would be appropriate room x, x uh, it's room one okay so uh, the room may be suitable for a specific functionality, or this may be suitable for a specific color range. So this is a little bit how uh, the rule uh, works. It's a, a bit difficult since we have this problem with the presentation, but I'm sure you get the idea. This is a, a, a bigger uh, query, but uh, uh, that query is uh, it's a, a little bit more complicated since it uh, involves the room, curtains, uh, cushions, uh, the wall. You can involve any type uh, of object that you like. So. Let me show this is uh, this is the, the interface of the system. The user uh, selects uh, items or uh, objects and they put it they put them on uh, the design. And they transform to XDB. So, uh, in principle, and soon, I believe, with more accuracy, they would be capable to create a space of their life and how their space would look like and demonstrate. And they, of course, uh, change any type of attribute, be it colors, annotation scales. The technology allows this very easily, and uh, and uh, I don't know. It. And these uh, these are the decoration a decoration rule. Uh, which corresponds to a query, one of the queries I showed you. Uh, why is it paused? It, oh no, it's not finished. Yes, it seems finished, but uh, it's not. Uh, after you 
press uh, this, uh, this button, uh, yes, uh, WRM query runs, and uh, it, the ontology rules run, and uh, it associates the color of the, uh, the, the floor with uh, items, and it proposes X3D items for the user to, to add specific style uh, color. They have specific style, color, etc. So uh, this, uh, this, this would be the final result. Uh, I, I'm sorry that uh, the video uh, does not contain uh, all uh, the, the case, but uh, I, uh, I may show it to you later on. Okay. So any question? So uh, it is easy to, to transform the ESVG representation to a uh, to next uh, uh, The ontology and the semantics uh, are useful for uh, making uh, assumptions, for, for uh, uh, making queries, expressing queries. Uh, ideally, you would uh, say, uh, what uh, furniture, what types of furniture, or what uh, would, would the program recommend uh, if uh, I change uh, the, the sofa mood to classic? This would be the ultimate goal. So I, 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 I may choose one or two or three uh, individuals, define some characteristics, a classical uh, sofa with, uh, I don't know, uh, a specific color in the curtains and uh, any other uh, such, uh, any other choice the user would want, would want and 
this would uh, uh, this combination would create a query a, a standard query, and when the, you run the query, it will uh, submit this relationship to the reasoner, which is an, a service used by our prototype, and uh, it uh, would uh, it would include this type of statements. If the color of X3, X3 where X3 is a color, it's, I don't know, blue, then, or if the sofa has a classic style, and the curtains are the Lubickian style of anything like that, then you can apply uh, and then the, the corresponding rule. Uh, yes. uh, I propose during the coffee mug it's possible to have another question and to go deeper. Well, it, for me, just a room like it's very, very interesting work, very difficult to explain, but it could be strange, but very interesting for nuclear engineering design. It's really the type of things that were interesting. Thank you. Johannes, are you ready to present? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I will switch between two slide sets and um, build on what I have talked yesterday about the instant really hub infrastructure that will give some more uh, feedback and or some more information about how it really relates to Xfreedom and on, uh, on the system that we use. So, so if you look at our business areas, it's uh, this virtual engineering block is where this is really positioned, where it's really all about uh, real-time uh, interacting and working with uh, massive uh, virtual engineering data, especially also in uh, immersive and uh, augmented reality application. So there is this visual decision support which really ranges from uh, visual analytics application but also medical application down to digital society where we uh, as probably Professor Ferner will later talk about this for example cultural heritage is a really important part of it so scanning uh, preserving uh, data there how we deal with it but all in this overall infrastructure. So this is 250 people working on these different topics. And we have quite a large list of, of industrial partners over the years. Unfortunately, yours is not here. <laughs> but yeah. no, that, the, the site is, is not updated. I need some last two, three years. And as I mentioned yesterday, there's a couple of other images. So we worked on quite different setups. So as you can guess, uh, cars is something that uh, is really important for us. That we're in the middle of Germany, so uh, getting uh, contract with people that are building cars is usually quite uh, uh, one uh, opportunity to, to really do project there. And there again. It was also always about getting this different kind of data in interactive environments. And we have built these cave systems in the, um, in the 90s with, for example, Volkswagen and a couple of other things. But we were all also always interested in, uh, just in for example, uh, dynamic visualization of uh, simulation data, uh, things like this. And, uh, one system that we have built over the years, the instant reality system, which was really the goal, uh, was to ease uh, the application development process. So we used X3D, we wisely choose, okay, we looked at what standards are available, and unfortunately for uh, virtual uh, reality, there is no really standard for, for application development, and that's why we adopted X3D and looked at the X3D specification and uh, really thought about how to 
re-sync and re-interpret some parts of it so it makes sense in a universal environment. So that was actually what we were 10 years about. So we were never interested in that. We, we didn't care about that. So that was uh, the time uh, where we also presented this in the virtual reality community. But time is really changing over the years. So uh, we started with this uh, systems on the big machines, on, on the Onyx machines in, in the 90s, and then uh, moved to uh, cluster machines and uh, distributed systems. We have built this high wall which had really 50 machines and 50 projectors, and so the question how to distribute the, the image generation process there was really essential. But over the year, our customers moved to smaller and smaller devices. So they became more and more capable. Uh, desktop machines were then as fast as, as the machines up there or faster. And for augmented reality applications, mobile devices is really what, where the, the whole game is going. So, this is now our main focus. This is where we are. And the interesting part is that that's also covered by that. So if we can base our, our whole technology and our whole platform on web, we can really cover all uh, or most of the use cases that people are interested in from the industrial application. And if we integrate what we already learned earlier about distributed rendering about how to connect different machines to generate images, then we, we can extend the web solution really to cloud-based solution. So that's, that is the story. So we were never really interested in web as uh, something we think we should, we, we, we should go, but we really thought web is a brilliant technology to get this uh, different devices problem uh, cloud -based. Okay. So, and this again is uh, the range of application we talk about there. Uh, the idea is really to have um, not a fixed application, but to enable application developer uh, to build their own application with just a few commands and just a few setup things without a complete scene crafting, without a complete setup, but just this really, really, really simplified. And there, we built this instance 3D hub infrastructure, which I presented yesterday already, which uh, can do this. Okay, so we want this web uh, technology there. And if you look at where we stand right now, there was a time with the plugins and, and everything, but then the last five years there was this rising star. So. Uh, WebGL was suddenly there, but it was only a, a more or less a mapping to OpenGL ideas. And it works now everywhere. If you look at the, the, the ratio, uh, it's really something that you can use to, to deploy in real applications. It's not just get, uh, uh, something to toy around, but it's, it's an extremely capable uh, system. And then, uh, but there are a couple of issues. So it's this really low-level uh, API. So for computer graphics geeks like me, it's beautiful because it's exactly what I have learned, what, what I love. But for everybody else that tries to build application, it, it's just not the patterns and the, the, the concepts. So. And um, uh, as in every uh, community, people, if there's a lack of, of uh, or this, this, uh, if there's this, if the concepts really break, people build uh, some form of middlewares to connect those. Unfortunately, these middlewares are most of them are really built for entertainment applications, so they're not focusing on, on industrial requirements and a couple of others. Security, they are always asked like how to get in uh, the layer that, that you can really transfer. So, that's the reason why we worked on this and the first approach that we did was really extending the, the declarative layer inside of HTML. And there was a, the X-Freedom system we all know and love because it's just so simple. You, you take the standard that you already know, it has an ISO standard, excellent 
people also from the industry accept that you can uh, take the documentation, understand it, implement it perfectly. So, and it has really a couple of, of extremely uh, great benefits. So, it's built on the standard, it's open source, it's a polyfill, you can just install it on your system. It has this application friendly DOM. So if you know how to, to implement application on DOMs, you know how to cope with, with it with freedom. Uh, and it already uses uh, some form of, uh, of advantages and in the, the current uh, browser infrastructure. The interesting part was that we gave this, to, especially to people that build industrial application, and they said, oh, nice, easy, great. But if I put large data there, it just breaks. So this problem, large data leads to long download periods and uh, low frame rates. Okay, horrible. So over the last five, six years, we mainly worked, we didn't really work on this uh, DOM uh, integration issue, but mainly on mesh compression and other things, because to get this loading period really uh, down, and we first worked on a uh, couple of ideas that we connected with the server and uh, this flexible multi-part setup where you can have, okay, I have uh, actually a DOM element which consists of multiple subparts. So, for example, a complex building or something else where you can say, okay, this is my object, but I have the subparts and the subparts are then not mapped into the, uh, in the DOM. So there was already this, we already broke the API uh, slightly at the, uh, that position, but there are still people using this multi-part uh, extension to it, really. Um, and then we were starting to, with this adaptive rendering control where we really uh, looked at the problem uh, from a different way that we said, okay, we have to go get rid of this low frame rate and we just define we have a fixed frame rate and then uh, show what we can just do in this 16 milliseconds or, or 30 milliseconds. But it was on the current infrastructure, on the current service infrastructure, it was really hard. But we had good results. So we, with this mesh compression technique, so in some, from the very, very early tests we did, it's a, it's a JT data set, uh, open JT data set, uh, which is a industrial data set, which is now uh, converted to X3D uh, using the very, very first implementation from uh, the image and binary compression techniques, so the very first thing. And we were e uh, able to do progressive loading, so that's this very first. Oh, where's my image? Oh, it is. So it's this binary data set over. Uh, a 3G mobile line where we where we stream data it was, was not so efficient as a pop-up. I had a bit different idea, but it already worked uh, quite well. So that uh, the results and uh, the nice thing was that we really got the binary sizes, for example, for triangles from the original XML encoding down to six bytes for triangle. That's what we're talking. So. And then, but it, the customers, especially in the industry, were still not happy. So, it's really, it's really a great solution, and, and ever will. And so it utilizes really this current technology directly builds on WebGL. It's great. This partial adaptive rendering can handle large data set, not really anything, not massive, but at least larger, so up to 10, 15 million polygons, if you optimize it well. And what's really nice, it, it doesn't need any compute on the server. So you just pull data from an HTTP server. Even if it looks like streaming, it just wisely uh, uh, downloads just a subpart of the package. So it looks like streaming, but at the end, the technology is really just pulling. So it scales extremely well. So if you go from 1 to 20 to 20,000 user, you doesn't break the system. You just need more standard HTTP server. And load balancing on HTTP server is a done problem. You just go to Apache or use an NGX or something else, and the same application will work for millions of users. So, excellent. 
So, but if you look at, at larger applications, so you really have to, to provide this small package. So somebody has to translate it, somebody has to deal with uh, preparation systems. And if this is an offline process, if you have to teach people, okay, you have to use AOPT or whatever, then they use it. Our, what we understood the last years is that people fail often to really understand how the data really looks and to make this process totally automatically. So we analyze the data and we map the data so that it, it really works, it's really key. So what is if the client doesn't support any 3D? Well, for security reasons, there is no option to translate 3D data to the client. That's also a key problem. So if you have a machine or a, a TV set or whatever, you would like to use your, to, to visualize your data and you cannot do 3D visualization. So what if you really have massive data set, not just uh, 10 or 100 million triangles, but really large data sets and would like to stream them really fast. So if you have scanning data of a full building, or uh, then it gets really hot. And what if you don't even have triangles, if you have some parametric surfaces? So there, there are a couple of other reasons or would really like to do a high engineering. So that's the reason why we said, okay, we move from this purely client-based technology to this mix of server and client-based technology where we can distribute all the different uh, uh, infrastructure. And that's where we actually had the idea to come up with this instance really hub infrastructure. And the main idea is that you have these three services, something that really knows uh, about the application setup has their RDF uh, graph describing the relation between your objects so you don't have to transport everything to the client, a transcoding service, visualization services, and then a really, really thin API on the client side. So you don't transmit everything to the client first with this heavy, heavy X3D graph, but keep most of the thing just on, uh, in this server. And so I just briefly go over the different parts. So uh, the visualization system really tries to uh, balance these different technologies. So client hybrid server based rendering. And uh, there's this video, I'm not going to show it again, but um, there's, with a Boeing, there's another one with uh, a car which uses the same technology. So it's this. Uh, server-based culling where the basic idea is that uh, if you have these complex setups and this this uh, this cars or, or other systems have this extremely irregular setup of, of data sets so it's not like geodata or so where you have these regular tiles uh, for rendering but you have this setup where it's a hard question how to calculate what parts are visible from a specific uh, uh, viewpoint. So looking at, at some parts and then knowing what uh, what parts really generate how many pixels, it's, it's a hard problem. So, and what we do, we just don't calculate this on the client, but calculate the visible patches on a server where we're much uh, closer to the original data and can do this efficiently. So that was a key idea. So we break up everything and okay. and uh, but also this uh, the, the quality aspect. So if you would have visualization, uh, if you do the visualization on a server, we are not limited to WebGL anymore. We can just uh, do whatever we want and whatever we were learned to do really uh, high-end 3D visualization in real time uh, on a server. But then again, with the, all these techniques have this iterative idea that you have uh, that they are really highly interactive in the sense of that you can easily nav navigate but then they have some form of, uh, of refinement and, uh, to get to the final image and then the same for the, the large model stream. Okay, so that was the idea. Then the transcoder service is something we worked on earlier and it's now totally generalized, so we can really transcode anything with, with the system. 
in regards to uh, this, uh, uh, I, I just explained yesterday, it's this L3D container set, which are this RDF description of uh, the data and, and station form. But um, what we do there, it's, it's a pretty simple idea and really minimalistic uh, interface contracts. So we, we really use basic HTTP uh, techniques uh, to get the data from the storage. Uh, so they just have to provide uh, API or uh, HTTP or HTTPS access where we simple get a command because we never write back to the database. We just get the data and this cycle, so putting data back is uh, in, uh, really the, the uh, is um, something the application itself has to do. Because otherwise we, we would have to be domain specific and that's what we really try to avoid. So it's a restful system, but as application developer, we never see this. So you just define uh, your in your API, you, you, you just use elements in the browser and this infrastructure is all hidden. But it's still inter interesting what we achieved. So it's really a basic uh, RESTful uh, service. Now it runs on HTTP2, uh, uh, but it's still the same thing. So it, you can just request the system and the system can map a generic URLs um, which are established in other communities. So for example, books or they have this generic URLs and this can maps this to generic URL to a specific uh, URL which is located in the storage and then we just request and we get instantly the address of the cache entry back. That's a, a, an that's a important part because there's no waiting or anything. If you request an L3D container, you instantly get it back, but it may not yet be ready. So that's the point. And then uh, you can use a WebSocket or you just, with really simple HTML techniques, you get an estimation how long it takes until it's available and then you just uh, request it again. So you get a 200 if it's available, 202 if it's not yet available, but probably, and we give you an estimation. And, uh, or 404 if it's just wrong. So, and there, that's, uh, the technique we really use to distribute all this uh, um, all this data preparation process. So uh, that's the reason why we really went down from an hour to less than uh, a second, uh, less than a minute now to uh, translate the original CAD data set of a full car to this L3D container. Because every part is really translated in their own chop and it's not just uh, distributed on the system but now on the whole infrastructure and that's the reason why we get this one. Sorry? Oh, we can. No. No. Okay. And the back is front end it's now this really neat thing we came up with. So that's this Cool infrastructure which uses all this neat uh, REST APIs and RDFs you can follow and a couple of other things. But that's usually hard for people to understand. And this web list thing makes it extremely simple to use the web list infrastructure because you just uh, use uh, web components so you can use HTML tags inside of, of the system and can just define relations for the visualization. And then it totally automatically uh, controls the image generation process. So it can be on a server, on a client, and, and mix it in between. And so it has this really minimalistic API, uh, deals with all the infrastructure, does the authentication, so it can uh, use this usually single sign-on techniques. And you can give URNs or whatever uh, part you have, and it just manages with with time type and, and time type handling and, and content negotiation. And this really allows to visualize extremely large data sets and extremely massive setups in in a web browser without really caring about what technology is used and how it works.
Good. So, final slide. Just to shock everybody, that's the, the, the current system. So, the REMs every, uh, go in here and um, and the, but the important part is, is really easy. So if you look at other, uh, if you go to Autodesk or uh, Oops or whatever and buy something, you, you only get this and have to really work with all the REST APIs. So they say, <coughs> have this huge infrastructure. And what's really nice here is that you only have to care about this part. So it's a really simple thing, and then he chooses all the different visualization techniques or whatever to uh, get the data to the report. Okay, that's the current status that this will change over the years. Thank you so much. So I, I think the um, move to um, uh, to the server side uh, rendering for a lot of uh, horsepower uh, makes a lot of sense. I wonder um, how how do you guys handle things like uh, like picking or so? And if I say I want to inquire about which part is that of all of these things, is that an operation that's basically happening on the server as well? Uh, right now, so the, the server, not just the rendering, but a couple of other things. So you can search, you can even send the array in the sect. So you can ask, for example, okay, I should array, give me the first object, but there's a volume, give me all objects that are in the volume, a couple of other things. That could easily be used. But uh, what we do actually is that we transfer, that's also the trick. So we transfer um, an ID buffer from the server to the client. And then all the picking and everything, and also measurements and everything is actually done on the client, even so the data was rendered on the server. Uh, and even the shading, so we, we transfer uh, enough information, so we transfer depth, uh, normals, and IDs to the client, and then the whole shading is actually done on the client. So in the new infrastructure, we hope there are a couple of reasons why we do this. Because then, if you have situations where you have some material changes because you highlight something or so, and you, you would uh, need to ask a server for a new image, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to, to keep this high interactivity, uh, that's really what they do. Yeah, the client. Then. Yeah. yeah it's, I mean, this how to incorporate it now the, the physical based shading on the client with server data mm -hmm. so that the servers uh, in the future uh, um, they will not uh, provide RGB buffers anymore. They just provide uh, buffers for the final shading mm -hmm. process on the client. And then transporting, also transporting materials to the client, it's usually not so uh, heavy because it, it's usually compact. And it doesn't change all the time. So if you change the camera, the, the parts that you really uh, visualize change, but the material that you that the parts have do not change. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why we think that the combination of server side culling, client side rendering, plus client side shading uh, is really. And also then it doesn't matter where the buffers are uh, generated. So the shading is just the same thing. The user doesn't know. It's interactive, it highly, uh, it updates everything, but if the, the base buffers for this were generated on a server or a microphone, mm -hmm. Super, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your impressive work. Um, and so, yeah. compared to Autodesk, compared to Autodesk, yeah. you had application, what is your um, most Great part, and then what is your future goal to benchmarking with other systems? We didn't benchmark any system, we, we just know a couple of other systems, but they're never as complete as, as this system. So, there are other systems that do server side rendering, but then you, you will have to deal with the server APIs and everything, or they do client side rendering, 
and then you limit it with what you can do on a, on a desktop. And even companies that provide both client side and server side. But then they have different systems and different APIs. So if you develop your, uh, your application, they probably do big analysis on your use case and have some decisions what to use client side uh, systems or server side systems. And the big advantage of our system is that this decision is done while the application is delivered in the user. So if you start the same application on the desktop, then it's client-based rendering. And if you start exactly the same application on uh, a panel or a TV or whatever, it's server-based rendering. And not the application developer and not the, the, the user it doesn't know what uh, technique is actually used. It's really just that both techniques don't really scale. One has a problem that the data is just too big, and the other one has a problem if you have uh, if you just add more use and more data, you have to buy all these boxes. And there are customers right now that really have both problems. And that's the idea is to, to have something that can really deal with it and balance both with the single idea. And there, of course, there are systems uh, just in regards to uh, benchmarking and so for a very, very specific use case. So if you look at, we also incorporate point-based rendering right now and a couple of other things. And the point-based rendering system will be extremely good because we also use octrees and do build regular structures from, uh, and that's what, what also makes sense for our clients. We have this large picture, so this will work really nicely. But geodata in general probably never as good as if you use a, a, a geo visualization system uh, that's really optimized for this uh, two and a half D type. Yeah. So it will, will work extremely well with cut data, structured data, bin data, uh, point data, and, and stuff like this. But if you look at one specific data, uh, then you may find a system that doesn't. So you guys using REST API to do the negotiations on your client server? We use REST API, so in the middle there are REST APIs to start with. But with then for we use, it depends on, it's really adaptive. It tries to, uh, it usually uses HTTP2, uh, REST and HTTP2, and then uh, uses web sockets to push data from the server to, so for, even for the, uh, service to service communication we use uh, purely sockets. Yes. So it's just for to get out of the system and to get into the system it's really using this standard intelligence. Okay, thank you very much. We are very lucky because the other session is late and we are on time. I can present a little thing to, to explain. Where are ODF and why we are so involved in the web trading consortium and not, not only? Uh, the presentation, uh, it's a presentation with Christophe Bouton, it's multidimensional browsing nuclear engineering data. Uh, the agenda, uh, EDF, for some people that, that don't know, uh, we are a global leader in electricity everywhere. In so world, very big company, very old company, uh, with roots uh, in Europe, from long term partners, from cooperation agreement in agro countries. Uh, EDF is very specific because uh, it's a world we are an operator, we produce energy, but in we are architect, engineer, and it's very specific very specific because it's not very common in the world to have two parts in the same company. It's very rare, it's not the case in the US, it's not the case in Japan, it's very specific. And when you are architect engineering, you produce a lot of data, a lot of graphic data, it's necessary, you, you, you work on the design. So, uh, a little for a project or program, uh, it's not so easy to imagine what, what is it, but uh, it's a long phase, different phase with design, build, and overall. Uh, 
and uh, it's a work in the real world and digital world today. Uh, definitely, uh, in R&D you start on the paper again today, and you produce uh, documentation, and after you have already built the plant, you start building, and uh, you open it, and you need to decommission. You have a lot of people, a lot of people from different fields, from different specialities at different levels. And uh, today, it's really the challenge to manage all the data on all the back time. Yes. Globally, on one century, you need to manage a physical nuclear power plant asset. You need to manage people and maintain know-how and manage a virtual nuclear power plant. And on one century, it's very a big challenge. Uh, a power plant, yes. Uh, we can imagine that a plant is just a facility a long parcel, but if you consider all the projects, you need to go above and to consider the country, all the level, because you need to consider the law, the requirement, uh, specific rules of a country. And uh, that's why we study uh, GES, uh, other standards like uh, IFC, uh, ISO uh, 15935, you consider pilot for the component, and all of that you are more in the concept than in the modeling of uh, the modeling, the representation, and we consider SVG to, to preserve the, the data. Uh, we work on STEP and we work on X3. Definitely today we have a strategy on that. It's not so easy inside the EF code to convince about that because it's really a change of paradigm. Uh, and uh, with X3D, really we arrive with new technology. It's very, very difficult. It's uh, a lot of talk, a lot of politics, uh, a lot of change of mindset. But we work a lot of that. And uh, the KM project, uh, I don't. Uh, show to you the, the video. I'm sure for some people that was in Vancouver, you, you remember the, the, the video of the nuclear PLA. If you are interested, I can show you the entire video for the people that don't see that in Vancouver. But this video really show comparison, explain from a car. We know today more than a car than in the poor plant, in the structure. Or Oops. Yes. But for the data and information problem is definitely uh, we produce some data with some people inside our company or outside. Those people work in a structure, very structured system. It's possible that system from DASO, CNNs or other system. Uh, some system very old. Uh, one of the main systems that support the design is the spreadsheet show like everywhere in the world. Uh, but the challenge today is really to federate all of that in a semantic way and to be able to publish not a part of the data, all the data at the same time, all the modalities, 3D, 2D, 1D, documents, photos, videos, point code, all of that at the same time. And the web browser and the web is a better medium to do that. Uh, data published. We work a lot with Christoph. It's really our subject today. Uh, for a long time, a collaboration that started in possible 2000, again, Christoph, where we work since. 2010-2011, we um, really try to to create a world. It's uh, the blue box centered on open and web technologies. In this part, it's difficult to challenge uh, the data making today, the authoring, 
we have a lot of politics to do, we have a lot of editor like Sam and that, so uh, they, are, they are the place. It's difficult to change today uh, CAD tools to turn the 3D uh, by a tool in the world. It would be possible, but that's not uh, the war for Christophe and me today. We really work on publication, how to fill it, all of that, and how to publish that on demand for the user. Where we are. We work on a concept. The concept is mosaic in French. Uh, it's very close. It's the same thing in English. I have changed the, the translation. Uh, for the story, it's the first name of the first web browser mosaic. Uh, makes an organized semantic access to information in context. We will really work on publishing framework that's renderable to make very quickly web app, web page, web application to be able to pass from 1D to 2D to 2D to 3D to the document and for low price because the objective is to publish all of that for all the business users. Today it's a more demonstrator close to prototype, depending on the people uh, that assess that. But uh, we work on the mosaic engine. This engine is really something that transforms some graph data, could be ontology result, and renders that in component, web component that support the restitution of the data. And a data could be a document, could be a 3D model, could be a 2D schema, something like that. Uh, but the objective of Mosaic, it should be agnostic, really, because uh, you can find a, a good component to show the 3D, like the component of uh, front of. Uh, you can find a good component to display SVG with zoom, pan, and, and activity. But I'm sure tomorrow I will have a better component. But it's always 3D or 2D, it's always a schema. It's always the same thing, the same interactive function. I just want, just here, I will work on semantic. And today for the 3D, Definitely, we work with uh, the technology for front of. Yes, videos. It's a bit long to show them. I can show the video just after. Uh, if you want, I want to make a live demo because I have a wide part of the data just here. Where we go, just to finish. Today, uh, Mosaic is more a demonstrator than a prototype. We really work to do a prototype with the Mosaic engine agnostic. And today, we are not agnostic with the graph database. Because it's a demonstrator, we go very fast to, to show the result and to make the marketing. We really work to make a system that is agnostic and can query any system that could give a representation of the data that just a graph or triple from authority. The second thing that we do is yes, we work on the component because today uh, will be able to, to show a, a demonstration after the session. Uh, we cover a lot of type of representation, the 3D, the 2D. We are able to show conceptual things with a network representation, a table, but uh, we make a, a big work to, to find a component, web component, to show project. And if you find the component, you need to make the conceptual structure in the mosaic engine to render that in a specific component. 
uh, the organization because it's crucial to modernize the people and the charge of the people with the organization because uh, a classical question for people is who is in charge of the subject. Uh, and to find crowd, and I really hope to be able to do that with uh, Final Fraud. It's very short, not very structured, but it uh, needs to still workshop. We really hope to, to, to submit a very, very structured paper next year about that. We are, don't have the entire strategy, but really for the, the mosaic engine, the restitution engine, I suppose we will do our best to give that to the community and to, to, to make a framework to support the publishing of 3D, but also 2D, 1D, and document and to offer that to the community. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will really Inside the all the different stakeholders in EDF and the different views of the information that you want to publish to, um, besides the point clouds and um, CAD models and, and geometry and stuff, is there a lot of use of um, actual graph data? I mean, sort of how uh, and you mentioned some semantics as well, but do do you want to publish? graphs or 3D graphs or how do you see that um, coming? Uh, for the graph data, uh, we manipulate only that every day. If you, when we talk about the usage of the spreadsheet in a company, specifically in India, it's just a graph. You have an end user that manipulates the data, introduces that in a matrix, but this matrix is a graph. I'm sure about it. We start to work on the visualization of the graph in a 2D with zoom pattern. Uh, we don't have any feedback right now, we just start. I'm sure that we will have good feedback for some type of application like uh, something like a requirement management or system engineering. Uh, for the representation of uh, the graph in 3D, uh, I'm not sure today. Uh, really, uh, I remember it's not a long time that I don't read about that, but there are a lot of work uh, during 80s or 90s on that, and it's a complex subject, and I'm not sure that it's very efficient. Really, uh, during my PhD, I work a lot on um, graphic semiology of Jacques Bertin, and I'm sure in 2D, for me, that just think it could be suitable. Or possible, you need to, to find other metaphors than the true 3D. 3D is very complex. Uh, it's very complex to navigate inside it. We really have to, 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 to work a lot on that. Uh, I hope to, to, to be able to, to work with uh, the team of, uh, of UNS about that, to, to, to mix to use the semantics of our object to support the navigation. Classical problem is uh, uh, today when we use uh, the classical technology of 3D, uh, specifically the, the, the technology for, for an offer, if you want to, to fly to an object, you don't necessarily consider what is this object. And you just have a best fit on the building box. But it, this object, is a room, you are not interested to have the best fit on the building box. You want to be inside the room, in the center, and to be able to navigate uh, around. But for the concept of the restitution, the concept of structure, I will not believe that the 3D is a good way. Okay, thanks. Uh, welcome to the workshop. I mean, we're calling this a workshop on, which I just like the name. But we're going to turn this into a workshop on uh, WebVR. I'd like to make this, uh, rather than me standing up here and spouting off a lot of stuff, a little more interactive. If you have questions or comments, uh, please 
interrupting and um, and all that. So uh, my name is Sandy Ressler. I'm from uh, NIST in uh, Maryland in the U.S. And how many people here have uh, think they know what WebVR is or have played with what what is called Web WebVR or are that's good. This is because I would consider this an intro, not an in-depth uh, look at WebVR. Um, we're going to go through uh, a variety of topics, uh, the hardware, uh, some uh, browser issues, some use cases, a little bit about integration, authoring tools, which is going to be really short because there really aren't very many authoring tools, and uh, a little bit about production chain. VR, so WebVR is uh, simply put VR, quote unquote, virtual reality on the web. And when I say on the web, I very specifically mean inside of a web, a web browser. So there's, there's a, a, a very specific, that, that's not, a, I will talk and use some examples of, of things that are you might uh, justifiably say are not with VR or more, or are more just simply virtual reality, but although they're related, but with VR um, is very specifically the use of uh, these kinds of visual environments in the context of a web browser. And what makes what makes those things uh, interesting? Yeah, DFD. <laughs> so what's the big deal? Uh, the, the issue is really, I'm just going to, is that uh, in the past, well, first of all, VR is sort of old. It's been around like for 30 years. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, the issue of putting a, a VR environment in context of a web browser means that if I create a world that I want you to wander through in, in 360, whether it's video-based or synthetic with computer graphics, I simply have to give you a URL and say, go to this particular URL, and assuming that WebVR works, which is not, um, which, which, which certainly will become a, a perfectly good assumption, um, you'll be able to see it and experience in the same exact way that you go to a web page and it renders correctly uh, with technologies like X3DOM, if, you, if, you, if I've created a 3D environment and I tell you to go to that page, it will simply display correctly, assuming you have a relatively modern browser. The, so the, the thing that's really made this happen is that the browser vendors, particularly uh, Mozilla with Firefox and Google with Chrome, are enabling the native support of head-mounted displays. And I'll get to HMDs, and I'll get to that uh, in a minute. But virtual reality is sort of back. It's become in fa it's very much in fashion now. Uh, this is particularly driven by um, the purchase of Oculus by Facebook. I think that one particular event uh, really got people very excited. But VR uh, itself dates back to the early 90s. I want to just give you a brief video clip. This will be, I have no idea if this is going to actually work given the wonderful internet that we have here. But I'm feeling it, we'll see. So this is a little clip showing uh, Jaron Lanier, who's sort of considered the quote unquote uh, father of uh, VR, using his uh, uh, VPL system, I think with a helmet and gloves. And that kind of thing. I guess there's, is there sound? Oh, there's sound. Of course, there's spacey, irrelevant computer music. I think that. Uh, so it was really amazing uh, for back then. 
clearly the uh, compute power in my cell phone is far superior to what, what they had then. But it just gives you an idea of, and these were, there were, so in the early 90s when VR first came about, there was a huge amount of excitement. There was a fair amount of money put into it. Uh, not huge, but um, everybody was very excited. In the same way now, you're hearing, you know, I, I, I was in the airport in Athens coming here, and there was a Samsung uh, here, here. display in the, in the hallway, and it said, VR is here, virtual, so there's a lot of hype. And, and this, is, this is very much a duplicate of what happened uh, in the 90s. But, so the question I think that we have to ask ourselves, on the other hand, VR totally failed. It went away. You know, after after about 95, 96, it pretty much went away. So the question is, why? And I think uh, pretty clearly it was ahead of its time. It was one of those things that was introduced ahead of its time. And this is like a whole uh, body suit. So you can see she's wearing like a magnetic. This is, I think, the definition of encumbered computing as opposed to unencumbered. That's a good trick, you have to remember that. Always just put a cute kid in the scene and, and then I'll sell you the sell you them. Anyway. So that's that's VR from the So that's VR from the uh, 1990s. And everybody's all excited again. Oh, this is a picture actually, it's it's my two kids with a VR helmet back in around 1993. It was just like a $50 toy, and it was uh, very cute and used. It made a great, very good picture. That was about it. And these are lots of. Uh, so I did. I recently did a search for you know virtual reality on Google, and these are all the kinds of pictures that you get. And there's uh, lots of helmets, and there's these things called a, a boom, which was an interesting device. I think does this work? Yeah, barely. Hold on one second. I have, I have another device. I have a super laser pointer. Um, so this was like a boom device where you could stick your head onto. I think it was made. This was uh, probably made by Fake Space. Yes. And you could put your head on uh, instead of you know physically strapping it to your face. You could just sort of gently put your head into it and move around. It, it was really a nice kind of. Uh, Nice trick. Uh, anyway, and some of these are becoming. Uh, so, so we've now got uh, Oculus with the. Uh, this is just repeating what I said. So there's lots of hype uh, in, a, in a variety of different domains, and the um, the new developments with. Oh, I need an additional hand. So uh, I guess this is really sort of referring to the um, the hype in the uh, in the '90s uh, and, and applications uh, came about, in, in my opinion, because the devices were, were too expensive. From a from a user interface point of view, uh, the experiences were really they were cool, but sort of disappointing. If I put on a helmet. After more than five minutes, I'd, I'd probably have this 10 pound thing sort of strapped to my head. And it was like, you know, very difficult to. I, I didn't bring a clip. I, I had, in the 90s, I had a setup where we did a simulation of like a manufacturing uh, station to make a part of an engine. And, you know, we had somebody put on a, a helmet and a, and a glove, and, and it was in front of a silicon graphics workstation just sort of polygonal, simple graphics that you go around. And really after like five minutes, it was, you know, forget it, this is not really usable. Um, and a lot of that was just, uh, however, uh, now uh, with the introduction, so now we've got uh, a lot of different companies are jumping into it. Uh, Facebook with uh, Oculus, Google supporting an effort uh, out in Florida. Um, Oh, magically, magically. Thank you. That's more augmented reality, which is augmented, right? It, it might pay to, to you know, let me explain the difference also. 
Um, so the experience was just not that good though, and, and the collapse and uh, low resolution, lag time. So you hear a lot, you'll hear a lot of uh, discussion in, in sort of the VR world about lag time. And lag is when I'm looking at a particular environment, my head is being tracked, so I turn my head and the computer graphics scene needs to adjust according to the way I just moved my head. If it takes more than a couple of milliseconds to do that, as I, as I keep moving my head, there's a really good likelihood that I'm going to get sick to my stomach. And that, there's an official name, it's called simulator sickness. And uh, I'm not convinced that's the only cause of simulator sickness, but it's certainly a big one. And so I know Oculus is spending a lot of time addressing that. Um, so in addition to, as I was saying, you know, Facebook and Google, Microsoft has HoloLens, which is another AR. Apple just bought a, another AR company called Mateo. So let me also explain the difference between VR and AR. And these can both be used in the context of a web browser. Um, if I have, so an, an AR system is one where uh, it's a semi-translucent display or, uh, or it's like a little piece of video in the corner of my, I guess it like uh, Google Glasses is kind of like a, a AR sort of system. But the idea is that you still exist, you still see the world around you. Uh, but I might see an object, a virtual object, so there might be a virtual person sitting in that chair who's not really here. Uh, and perceptually, one would like it to be as high fidelity and high resolution as possible. So um, the Holodesk uh, effort from Microsoft and uh, the Magic Leap work uh, funded by Google are going after that uh, market. I think they are still focusing on games. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I know in, in entertainment. The other thing that's happened is a lot of a lot of most of, a lot of the com companies have created uh, film studios and or are working with film studios. I know that the Magic Leap people have connections with the folks that did. Uh, uh, Avatar and uh, Oculus has something called Oculus Studio, which is basically a, an independent entertainment creation group, I believe. I'm a little dubious because when engineers produce content, it doesn't usually wind up being terribly com compelling. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, let's get into the hardware a little bit. This is a picture of a guy, it's not the Oculus, it's the, uh, there's another game company, Gear, Gear VR. Well, that's the Samsung he's wearing. No, 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 this is, this is not, no, there's another. There's the uh, Game Face, there's Game Face, there's. Yeah, my, my brain is gone with it. But anyway, the, um, so one of the things though, in this particular picture, with, with, to note is he's got a, uh, a head-mounted display, whatever brand it is, doesn't really matter. The, uh, you know, so he's got um, a reasonable resolution display in there. But in front of the uh, device, they've strapped on a leap motion uh, device, which the leap is, I should have brought one, but is a very inexpensive little uh, device, about $50, $70 US. Maybe pretty soon we can buy them in drachmas. And, uh, when the, what, you, what you do is use the leap uh, in order to provide uh, quote unquote natural input into your virtual environment. So I'm looking at the scene and I can, you know, what he's doing, he's looking at his hands recomputed as a sort of computer graphic uh, device. Because one of the problems, one of the big problems with VR is input is really difficult. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So you've got, it's still an encumbered kind of environment. You've got a lot of stuff strapped on your head. You have the display, you have headphones. You might have some extra input tracker. It's not, I'm, I'm a little dubious about how long somebody's going to last in this thing. Uh, but we'll see. It's still a little bit early in the game, and I'm sure the, the hardware is going to uh, improve a lot. This is an image of another extremely encumbered device. It's the the helmet of the F-35 uh, pilots, and it's actually also, I believe, an augmented system. So there's probably some extremely high uh, 
brightness display. And what you can do with it is like look through the floor and see through the airplane. You can see all the surroundings, but it goes for a mere $400,000. At the total opposite end are things like Google Cardboard and uh, the Dodo case, which is a similar thing. And what people are really brilliantly doing is basically taking a piece of cardboard, which made a framework that you shove your cell phone in it, and you're looking at your cell phone in, you know, to an inch from your eyes. That's why you know, 600 DPI cell phone Screen displays make a little bit of sense now to me. The, they've also cleverly set them up so that there's a little magnetic switch that uh, triggers the, the sensor of the cell phone if you want to like uh, select an object that you're looking at. And the other brilliant aspect about it is that it's using the inertial sensors of the motion of the phone as the way to track your head. So you get full head tracking at least uh, orientation tracking, I should say. You get XYZ uh, orientation of your head, not the XYZ position, but for, for, you get most of the effect. And it's really, I think I have the quote here. Yes, is, is Google Harvard is, is VR's gateway drug. This is a quote from somebody at Wired. And, and I totally agree, because I think it's just brilliant. There's no, there's a, a huge audience of, of people that have cell phones and sticking them in the uh, car, you're not going to get the highest resolution kinds of experience, but it's kind of like the, you know, to paraphrase the what's the best camera, it's the one that you have with you, and it's the same for, for VR, with the best VR device is the one that you have with you. So, uh, in, in going back to input for uh, where the guy was uh, on the previous photo with the leap motion, input is still an unsolved research problem for, uh, for VR in general. And, and it's hard because the thing you have to keep in mind, you strap this, you strap this thing on your face <coughs> and your hands disappear. So even just sitting in front of a computer at my desk, you know, I put on an Oculus, you know, I'm like, I'm a blind person feeling around for the mouse and, and or the keyboard, I'm always hitting the wrong keys. So in reality, what I'm doing is I'm taking the, taking the head mounted display and I'm looking underneath it for where's the key that I have to hit. Uh, so that what I mean input is difficult is that what you want to do is, a, is come up with methods where you don't have to cheat and look under the helmet or in the cracks and to find your mouse. You want to use your hands or your head position so one of the one of the um, demos that uh, Mozilla uses for uh, selecting so in, you're in your web browser and you're let's say using a, an Oculus, you'll have a panel of flat sheets in front of you, like surrounding you in, a, in 360. And as you move your head around, there's a cursor, and it, when the cursor is on the particular uh, movie, I think that these are movies that you want to select. You know, you hit the space bar, or you do still have to hit a key. I don't think there's any buttons that sort of come natively with the Oculus. There may be, I'm not sure, like on the head. I'm not, not sure. Um, another possibility that one thing is there's a company called uh, Fovi, F-O-V-E, that does eye tracking, which is built into the headset itself, which is kind of cool. And then it gives you the ability to look at a particular spot, let's say on a web page, if it's a virtual web page or in uh, whatever environment you're trying to be in. And then you could theoretically blink your eyes to select something. So then you don't have to worry about trying to find the keyboard and the mouse. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting. Another problem is when I'm reaching out into the world and I want to touch the page, Let's say I have a leap and there's a virtual hand inside the inside the the area. It's very difficult to get feedback for I've actually reached, you know, the Z, your depth perception between the synthesized graphics of your hand and the synthesized
synthesize graphics of whatever's in your environment, it's kind of difficult to match up, so you have to have some feedback. What you'd really like is some sort of a haptic feedback, something to shake. And there's been some experiments with that. I recently saw um, a demo from Disney Research where they're able to direct a, uh, really a puff of air so that you can literally feel spots in the, in the air, which is really kind of funny. Um, so that I would say, and, and the, all the links to these things are uh, in the talk, and you can get on the front of the, uh, this talk will be made available, and, and you can uh, see it afterwards and follow the links. Stereo is also difficult, uh, much more than I, I was really aware of when I started to deal with it. Uh, the projections that you use for uh, mapping, for example, video. I'll show some uh, 360 video in a minute. Um, when, you, when you have uh, image-based, uh, let's say, 360 video, you really have to be careful to how it's projected, and there's a lot of different projections. And what I mean projections is how do you go, you know, you're sitting in an environment where you want to have the illusion of a 360 view, 360 surroundings, but you've shot video really with, uh, it's a 2D, it's a two-dimensional uh, image, which has either been warped correctly or incorrectly onto the sphere, and sometimes it's a cylinder, so you really have to pay attention to that. <coughs> and the, so that just gives you the illusion of, of 360. That's got nothing to do with stereo. Stereo means you have to have two of them. So, you, so there's slight differences between the left and right eye. From the uh, production point of view of creating these things, it's really, it means that you have to be shooting sort of and dealing with twice as many files, and, and uh, it's just a, a much more logistical kind of nightmare. The, um, why don't I show the video since I was just mentioning it. So this is an example of some video that I made uh, about four or five months ago, I was working with some folks at uh, CSIRO, which is an Australian uh, research organization. And what we did is we took a collection, there's sound, but it's annoying sound. The, uh, so this is just a short 30 second uh, piece of video with a loop, and I'm playing it back in a web browser, but it's using uh, 360 Heroes, I believe, uh, player. And I want to show, so here's, if I select the quote unquote normal view, so this is, this is, so in this case, you know, I'm substituting the mouse for what will be the head position in the rift. I, I unfortunately don't have a rift with me, so I'm not going to actually be able to show uh, what that looks like. But in this case, we've got a, we've got a piece of video which was created by taking six GoPro cameras and you sort of slap them onto a sphere. And so it's shooting all uh, six directions. And then you wind up with six streams of video and you shove it into some software which stitches them together into a, a single, uh, I think it's an MP3 or MP4 video file. And then the software will stitch it into a globe. That, but it's still, yeah, I, could, I could actually play this video in a uh, just a quick time player, although it looks all sort of funny and distorted. Uh, if you play it back then in a, in a proper viewer, which is what this is, so I can spin around and look up and down in this building. But it, and it is a video, so there's me nonchalantly walking down the hallway because I was like carrying around this 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 device, this globe of six GoPros around a ball looks like that's a nuclear device that you want to you know, blow up in the building. So I was just sort of put it on the side and you can control it with a remote control to turn it on and off, which was, which was very convenient. Um, and then sort of the part, so that the downside of the GoPros is a lot of, it's logistically difficult to sync things up and, and, and then get all that uh, data into the camera. Although I think there are some new rigs that let you do that a lot easier. Um, the upside is that you can produce very high quality videos with it. And this is an example of some other projections. So this is a flat view. So this is actually, this is playing the video where you're seeing all 360 uh, 
really incorrectly, but you're seeing it all in front of your face. But it, it does give you an idea of what this is in some sense what the raw footage looks like. And the pieces were stitched together nicely by the software. And I think actually the software is from a company called Color, which like starts with K, and I believe they were just bought by GoPro. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces in the, in the sort of the oral world these days as far as companies. And the, uh, the little logo floating in there, because we were too cheap to buy the actual software, this is the, the freebie 30 second version. But it was great for, uh, for testing. And then here's another, just other projections that you can do. Not completely sure. I, I think the, these other projections are useful if you've shot something with uh, different kinds of lenses, and this will sort of warp it um, correctly. Or, or, um, or you know, this is this little plan of view, so I think you can warp it in different ways. But again, this is, this is at least in the context of a of a web browser. The, um, what I want to do is also let um, Mike Arato give a little background of some, some other web VR work that's going on from the consortium, uh, which is called these VR hackathons, which I think are turning out to be very popular. Like, lots of people show up at these things, which is really awesome. And uh, I'm going to just give a quick five minute shtick. Um. Last, uh, well, sometime last year, um, actually someone from the community, someone, if you're on the, active on the list, some may know Dave Arendash, who's a 3D content developer for over a decade, um, in, the, in the Bay Area said, hey, we, we, why don't we have a VR hackathon? And so um, Damon Hernandez, who's part of the consortium, he's one of the evangelists uh, in, the, in the Bay Area. Um, then took that um, idea, talked to me about it, uh, since I'm on board, and um, I thought it was a great idea, so we pitched it to the board and got approved. And so this created the VR Hackathons, uh, and we have the, the domain now, vrhackathon.com. And it started off in uh, October of last year. We had about 130 people show up uh, in a um, theater that had been re-converted uh, into sort of like an art space. And um, it was really great, um, and people wanted to do it again. And so this sort of snowballed into an effort, and now um, we had a second hackathon um, over the Labor Day weekend, which was a poor choice. Uh, we still had about 30, 40 people there, and um, there's one going on right now in Seattle. Sorry. It's my, there's one going right now, uh, on right now in Seattle. Uh, as you can see right there at this very moment, uh, and that's got about 50 people. And then um, Damon um, went hog wild and global, and so now we're having them in, as you can see, South Africa, Albania, and um, I think South Africa and Albania, there's one more. And then also we had a mini hackathon, you can see it in New Jersey, and we had middle, middle school kids do it. And so um, when we were, you know, with, I, I, I don't know if Sandy's going to cover this, but I was going to just show them a little bit. I mean, web VR, specifically about um, X3DOM, um, does have examples on their web page. Yeah. You want me to show? I was going to. Sure, go ahead. Um, and here's the, what the code looks like. Um, well, actually, they have an example called the classroom. Um, so they've modeled the classroom. Uh, they've used, I think, SRC to do this, but um, uh, they also have a code that they've dropped in for the leap motion, which uh, Sandy referred to you before. And uh, if you go to their uh, examples, uh, here it is. And what, what's, what's, uh, I want to think of this page, besides the page, maybe it's too big. But I just want to make Because I just want to show you, all you have to really do is 
There we go. So, um, what's really good, good, great about this is you just leave, uh, you just take this code snippet, um, and instead of uh, taking the classroom, uh, which starts about right here, but then shape, you can uh, take all this out here, so from about here, and Mike, you did this, I think, too, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Take it up about here, and you go all the way down. Um, but then that, you can put your own X3D code, and it'll work. And so you'll immediately have a web VR if you have an Oculus, and you have a leap. Um, you can plug it in, and uh, you replace that, that snippet of code there with your own um, X3D code. And you immediately have an environment that you can experience with the Oculus and the leap. They also have code that just has, that code right afterwards, I think is um, leap code. Well, here, it starts here actually. That's, I'm sorry, the shape ends there. So it's all uh, that up to the other shape. But from here down, it's uh, the leap code. Uh, and then also the code for um, the Oculus, the shaders and stuff for positioning. So it's really simple. And so using the X3 Dome example uh, page, you go there, and you, if you already have X3D code, and you have a rift and you have a leap, you can uh, walk through your, your virtual environments that you've created with X3D. So um, for, as far as VR hackathons are gonna go, we're gonna try and, I'll probably have one every year in the, the Bay Area um, and other global sites, uh, and probably one in Seattle on an annual basis, and then probably also one maybe in the East Coast. And um, when we go to those VR hackathons also, we don't limit people to just doing X3 down. A lot of people are doing work with Unity. Um, and um, or no one is working with Unreal. Most of the people are doing work with, with Unity. Or any other uh, 3D, uh, you know, virtual reality type of uh, technology or augmented reality. So uh, anyway, you can go to our website. We usually put the links to the winners. You can see some really interesting stuff that was done. Um, we usually have different categories too. The first one we had multiple categories. One was mobile, one was x um, one was just best looking scene, one was in health. Um, and we had similar categories with the, over at the San Francisco one. I'm not sure what categories we have in the Seattle one. But anyway, and there's, uh, you know, we were able to get cash prizes. Uh, we got some free Oculus Rifts that we've been, we've been giving away, free leaps, things like that. Great, thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to. Yeah. So, can you talk a bit about um, Mozilla's web VR project and the night they built? Have you been successful getting the Oculus Rift to work with? You mean recently or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. well, actually, it works I mean, this, well. This is one way, and it uses the instant I.O. No, no, mm -hmm. that is not instant I.O. Mm -hmm. Oh, this. The, oh, so, yeah, let me just. Yeah, so, okay, so there's actually, but he's re Mike's referring to this. There's two ways with, within sort of the X3D frameworks to get into the Rift. So one way is what I, I just showed you is through X3 DOM this way. This is actually using uh, the native drivers that are in the browser, the two nightly builds of the browsers that Sandy had been referring to earlier. So there's nightly builds of Chrome, which is called Chromium, and then there's a nightly build of Firefox, which is called Firefox Nightly. And those actually have native drivers for the Rift. As far as the leap goes, they have JavaScript code, uh, JavaScript libraries, you just add that in. But the, the key one was because of the latency, which you know, Sandy referred to the simulator sickness problem. Uh, when they provided those native drivers for Firefox or, or Chromium, um, that really made web VR, which is what Sandy's talking about, real practical. And, and something that really has the potential to be exciting. So what Mike referred to is within instant reality, they have something called instant IO, which sets up, I think, a web socket. And um, they do also have, um, uh, they have uh, support for about 150 input and, and output, uh, input devices like uh, the Connect um, and the Rift and a whole bunch of, and the Leap and a bunch of all others. But that goes through a separate uh, WebSockets framework. Uh, and so 
probably more laggy, especially with the, with the rift. So what you want to do is you want to use the X3 down code there and use the Firefox or, or Chromium nightly build to get the, uh, to work with the rift. It's, a, it's actually the, the instant I/O is a more is a more general uh, method of getting I/O from basically yeah, any, any kind of random device. Yeah. Uh, it's a little more kludgy though to use because you have to start you have to install a um, instant I/O server um, on the machine and then your in your browser you become a client. I think I'm pretty sure I, I did it once actually I'm trying to show get a yeah, due to our great internet connection. Um, exactly what we, you know, we didn't plan it, but it would have, would have been a great segue because Mike was showing the, um, the code that you use for uh, taking X3 DOM and using it with the Rift. And I've actually done that and have an example of a scanning tunneling microscope uh, geometry that we have at NIST, and, but it doesn't seem to want to load. So just imagine. <laughs> That's why we show the code. That's why we call it virtual reality. He's shown the source so you can see where the. Where yeah, I'm going to show a picture actually. Let me just kill this. And so if you look at this, hold on, hold on. This pretty color graphic in the. This color. Okay, so this is a. It's actually not a bad illustration. So this is the left eye and right eye views, so it is in full stereo, of a, a fairly complicated geometry of the, the head of a scanning tunneling microscope. And actually, so this is only part of the object, but it's about two inches high in, in real reality. It's, it's actually a physical device. And this uh, area here, is a little platen that moves by uh, piezoelectric motors, just tiny little bits, and it looks at atoms and moves atoms around. And uh, we had a nice, uh, it was originally created, actually this is another sort of amusing plug for just standards. Uh, this was a demo that I created 15 years ago uh, to help these guys get funding for their um, equipment. And recently, like, a couple of years ago, I sort of resurrected it into uh, X3 DOM, and uh, that was sort of a nice, uh, and it just works fine, which was great for uh, great for me, and it was nice to have as an example. Let's see if it was so can you say a few words about the kind of RPE that is exposed to the uh, Yakult script side? So yes. you will have to render two uh, like GL canvases, and each one will be used for I'm, one eye? Or I'm trying to remember if there's two canvases or if there's one canvas with two um, areas. I could look. Yeah, the details are not important, but just the yeah. But basically, you uh, create a canvas, a WebGL, you know, that WebGL renders to. There's a little chunk of code, of WebGL code, that loops through the rendering cycle. There's a, a little chunk of, co of JavaScript code that makes the adjustment for the left and right eye uh, displays. Um, and then it just calls the, uh, the regular uh, X3 DOM rendering. So there is, there, is a little, there is a little chunk of WebGL stuff that, because what, what we need, I think, which it, it would not be that difficult to create is a little template that that is, you know, a little script where I input uh, X3D and I output X3 DOM, but X, so that X, there's an A, something called AOPT, which is part of the X3 DOM uh, code, which is a script script based tool that lets you do that. But what would be nice would be to have a, a modification of that, you know, with a Rift flag. That lets you put out X3 DOM that has the part that does the left and right stereo and, and deals with the with the um, web VR devices. So, so the code also uh, looks for the existence of a an HMD, so a tracker, and it's getting and and in JavaScript when the when it gives you a, a true that a tracker exists, that's 
only, it's only true because you're running the Firefox nightly or the Google Chrome. Yeah. Uh, but the browser must have some way to feed back the orientation and position of the head. Right, that comes, so, so the data for the uh, orientation uh, and position of the head tracker is read by, uh, is being gathered by the browser itself mm -hmm. and, and put into JavaScript for you. You just have to call the right variables um, and access them. But without the, without the native support, then you're hosed. I mean, it doesn't work. You, know, you have to get the, uh, or you have to have like the instant I.O. kind of a setup where you have some server somewhere that's looking at the devices that have been, you know, pre-set up to be on a particular port. Yeah. And um, this API is standardized? Is it VR? Is it a standard? No, of course not. Uh, the, there are, uh, they kind of agree on it. So the, I mean, the reality is that it was like two guys, you know, there's one guy working for Mozilla and another guy that works for Google Chrome, and they talk to each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it works, uh, which is sort of good. The, the downside, and I'm not quite, so the unfortunate part is that it's not, so, it's not the browser side, is that uh, Oculus, as of about a month ago, has stopped supporting uh, the Macintosh, for example. So that sort of, since I work on Mac, I was like, stuff kind of stopped working. They, they really like removed everything, like even the old, the old libraries dealing with the Mac disappeared, or maybe they're back now, but uh, time. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a third party tool, I think it's called OSVR, which is a open source VR framework, which talks to the Rift for sure. I'm not quite clear how to use that from, I haven't used it yet, and I don't know how to use it from the browser, but I'm pretty sure you can. So I might switch over to that. Um, it's not, so it's not really been standardized, but it's like, you know, the two major browser vendors work with it. I don't know what the deal is if I want to do it from uh, Internet Explorer, even like the newest Internet. But Internet Explorer is now pretty good, the new one, they support. I think it's really up to 11 now. And um, so it's pretty good and they support WebGL fully. Um, so things things are getting better in that respect, but I don't know what's happening with the uh, support for the device, for the, uh, for the devices. Um, so just there is a, a mailing list, web-vr, mm -hmm. that you should be on if you're interested. Right. It has, right, right. it has, um, it has uh, those two developers uh, from uh, Firefox, who is uh, Josh. Uh, yeah, actually up here. So there's Vladimir Vushevik from Mozilla. Actually, and some guy. yeah, and Josh. And then also uh, Brandon, um, what's his name? I'm trying to look That's here. also a link to, uh, to a slide set that explains the gory details of web, of web VR from the uh, API point of view. So, um, I didn't want to just, I'm incompetent to get into too much detail, so I'll just point you a good slide set. Joshua Car Carpenter from Firefox, Brandon Jones, and Vlad from, uh, mm -hmm. and they're on there all the time talking, so if you go to that, you'll get right. the latest and greatest. From so the other thing, which, which I guess one other aspect, which is maybe just a peculiarity for my own brain, uh, of one of the differences between VR and web VR from a while ago and now is simply the use of 360 video. Because I don't remember back in the 90s uh, people doing that. It was all just synthetic computer graphics. And one of the things that got me hooked again on VR was I went to um, a website called VR Video, I think it's called. Okay, there's a small. I wonder if I have a demo on here. Let me see if I don't. So there's a company called Jaunt, Jaunt VR, and they seem to have deals with lots of famous people. And I went to a. And six million dollars, I think. Yeah, they had. Uh, well, it's okay. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> So yeah, I don't have, you have to download it uh, locally. Anyway, uh, there was a demo of Paul McCartney uh, on a conference on, uh, 
on stage, and I put on the Rift, yep, the Oculus, and I was on stage with Paul McCartney. Like he was playing away, and I turned my head to the left, and there he was. I turned my head to the right, and he there was the drum player, and it was really cool. And, and then it also pointed out some some problems. It was interesting because so you're watching the demo of McCartney playing, and and then. He's not next. He's he's not next to you. It's like where am I? So they like change the point of view, kind of arbitrarily to some other place off stage, and it's like, and then you finally realize where you are, and then you, and then they keep bobbing back and forth. But it was it was an interesting. It's it's very. I find it very compelling to sort of uh, deal with uh, video scenes in, uh, in, a, in a VR environment, and and that's one thing from a content point of view, which. Uh, it's very different than the old, you know, 90s days, the mid 90s uh, VR in the first time around. And I think a lot of the companies recognize that, which is why they're sort of getting into uh, content development. Let me see if. So in terms of the uh, the kinds of actual things that people are going to use this stuff for. Certainly games and therapy, Oculus is very much going after the game market pretty much only, uh, at least for starters. Uh, I guess you can't blame them, that's sort of what's going to drive revenue. Uh, there's been a lot of work in sort of fighting fear of X, or your fear of spiders, fear of height, fear of flight. public speaking. Huh? Fear of flight. Fear of flight, yeah, there's lots and lots of, and it's been shown you know, they're, they're, these things actually seem to work. I, th I think more, there's a lot of uh, work for sort of PTSD kinds of applications. You know, veterans have come back from wars, and, and there's a lot of uh, good uh, use of uh, VR environments for that. Another effort that just kind of, I love this, this is probably my favorite example of a recruiting <coughs> uh, tool. So there's a cup, so remember the days of Second Life. Second Life was sort of the big thing. Um, oops, why is this not doing this? Oh, no. Second Life was the big thing. Yeah. There we go. So this was a. Uh, So they have a system called High Fidelity, which I think is a horrible name because it implies that they're dealing with a company dealing with sound, and it's not. It's supposed to be just high quality. And what they've got, so that's I think Phil Rose, an avatar of Phil Rosedale, who created Second Life, and now he's got this company called High Fidelity, and they're trying to create the quote unquote metaverse. Um, and this is not a web VR example, it's sort of a separate application that you run, but it's um, pretty compelling though when you have a lot of people that you can talk to. And I wound up uh, I'm logging in. So this is actually a uh, advertisement for a job that they did in real time. Sort of in the so I thought it was a great way of advertising it was there. Uh, And, um, but I don't think they, so they claim that they're going to have, you know, thousands of people. Like one of the problems with Second Life was it kind of petered out from a scale point of view. After, something's, you know, I have some video playing, sorry. So Second Life kind of petered out, I don't know if you recall, like if you go into a room with 10 people, maybe it works, but if you went to a quote unquote concert in Second Life and there were Few hundred people, everything sort of fell apart, and it didn't really. The system didn't really scale. And they're claiming that they sort of are solving some of those issues. And they're trying to do it by setting up a, a more distributed, you might say cloud-based, but not exactly uh, server uh, client-server situation. So, like, if I am a customer and want to play with High Fidelity, if I don't have enough resources, they'll, they'll first of all, I, I might run a high fidelity server on my machine for which other people can use. It kind of reminds me of like file sharing, point to point 
uh, file sharing sort of systems is, is I think the model, what they modeled after. So they, they might have a shot of, of dealing with the scale problem a little better. Excuse me one second. There's a video playing, oh here it is. You know, this is the, whoever decided to put the little icon on the tab of the web browser that says sound is playing needs to win an award. In terms of, so that's sort of the metaverse version of this. Um, the, again, uh, not to repeat, but you know, the, the acquisition of, of Oculus is really what kicked things, this new round of VR off. And I guess Mark Zuckerberg, who owns Facebook, is pushing the whole sort of, I think, metaverse kind of thing. And I, I suspect in, I'll give it another, I don't think it'll be instant, but in the five to 10 year time frame, I might believe some significant aspects of it will, uh, will happen. I'm, I'm, I'm yet to be a complete believer on spending long periods of time with a helmet strapped to your face. I'm not sure that'll, that'll work. It'll have, to, it'll have to work really well and be, and be very compelling, but it, it may happen. That's pretty much, I have some random, I do want to point out one other technology that's at least worth being aware of, which is this stuff called light fields. And without getting too technical, because I'm also incompetent of it, the, uh, the idea is, and this is what, so there's a company called Otoy, and there's the links there, that's claiming to, so a light field, I don't know, is anybody here familiar, there was a camera called the Lumia, I think it was the Lumia, that you can take a picture and then you display it on your computer and you could refocus. So if something was not in focus, you could refocus. And you could also change the orientation a little bit. So like if you were blocking somebody, you could move a little bit side to side. And it's kind of cool, and I always thought, you know, all right, it's cool to refocus and I, to, to be able to move your head, like, what's the big deal? But like, I don't really care that much about that. Well, it turns out that it's really a perfect uh, set of data for VR, because every person's pupils are in different sizes. So there's the inner pupil IPD, the inner pupillary distance. And I might have a piece of data that I've shot, or a scene, and typically, if you're showing stereo to somebody, it's a fixed, it's a fixed distance for whatever you're projecting. Like if you're in a, in a movie theater, with a light field, it can be customized since you can adjust this little bit of parallax. It can be customized for each individual, so you get the pupil distance perfect, so you can get perfect stereo. And the other thing you can do is because you can move your head around. If, you, if you're sitting with a, a position track display, like a helmet, as you move your head around a little bit, you get more of a sense of immersion, but just that little bopping of your head around. Uh, the other thing that's happening is you can take sequences of light field areas, like in, let's say in this room, you know, you could shoot like a spherical, the same way I showed that GoPro example I had earlier. You could take other uh, in a similar way, instead of capturing images, you're capturing light fields, and you can seam them together. So supposedly, you can, which I have, I've seen a, a video which doesn't really show it terribly well, you can then simply move freely around in the room, which is, and again, this is image-based stuff. So I'm, I'm waiting for uh, that. I, mean, I, I, think, I think, to make a long story short, light fields are, are really a perfect match for, for VR kinds of displays. Could you also uh, refocus uh, when uh, yes. you detect your point of focus and then focus on this point? Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure what that would mean for the display, but but um, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm a, looking. Has an additional sensor. <coughs> you can't. You certainly, I know that you can refocus. I'm not sure how that would, you know, how would you communicate that from your. I guess with eye tracking, you might. Yeah, eye tracking. With eye tra yeah, that, that would, was, must you, be weird. I think it absolutely could work. 
and, it, and so, and it turns out that, that um, from Alola, I know that NVIDIA is coming out with light field displays. They turn, they're really actually very inexpensive. It's basically a Fresnel lenses, like little spherical plastic lenses that, you know, from the, from the acquisition side. Um, so I think that's like a very interesting thing at least to sort of keep in mind for the future. And that's pretty much, pretty much it, folks. Anybody have any questions, answers? But I do think the, um, <coughs> again, the, the marriage of the web and uh, VR environments, it's, re it's really more of just VR taking advantage of the traditional advantages of the web you know, ubiquitous distribution and uh, being able to disseminate information uh, just by sending somebody a URL. And that's, I think, the, you know, the actual experience of looking at a VR environment inside of a web page is no better than a standalone application, except it means that somebody did not have to bother installing the separate application. Like right now, I wanted to show you the Paul McCartney video Thing and I don't have the application installed. So if they had done it with a web VR environment, I could just go to the URL. So that's sort of the. Not yet. Yeah, except for. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good point. I could try that. Uh, anyway. What about under uh, like the whole Microsoft HoloLens and, uh, mm -hmm. and then there's another? Uh, well, there's, I mean, there's, you know, that's an AR sort of, I knew nothing about it other than it's supposed to be an augmented reality setup and I've seen a picture of the, the helmet. I think I had a picture in here somewhere. Yeah, this is not working. Um, and, hold on, I might have a picture. I have on this other side, so one second. Um, then there's another company in Florida that's making something. Yeah, I have a but the okay, um, that the uh, Magic Leap. Magic Leap. Yeah, that stuff is just not loading. I had a picture of the. Uh, now here's a good picture of the kinds of cameras that you use to create the 360 videos. There's a lot of different, so on the left side here is a, that's a Ricoh camera. It's got two spherical, um, uh, two sides, so you just hold it up and, and it will shoot 180 degrees on one side, 100 degrees, and then there's software to see them together. There's a... Um, I actually have now like three cameras. There's the Ricoh, there's a Kodak that's also a, a, a half of a half of a sphere, and there's another camera called a, a VR360, which is really nice. It, it actually uses old technology. It has a camera pointing up at a conical mirror, so it sees all 360 degrees at once, and you don't have to seam anything together with software because it's purely optical based, you know, the, the image that you get back is really nice, but it's limited to just a 60 degree vertical field of view, so you don't get 360. I guess you, um, that's a real nice, uh, nice camera for doing these kinds of things. I wonder if I have, if you wait one second, we could do another frustrating attempt to See something? I actually have that video. Let me help this test. Oh yeah. So this is a. This is using that camera I just said, which is the uh, pointing at the conical, at the conical, uh, conical mirror. You can see it's really got nice seams. Like you can't see the seams at all. <laughs> something else. We'll see. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe we'll get something. 
Yeah, and uh, the downside of this one, at least for now, is that you have to upload your video onto the VR video website. They have to host it. Because um, I think they're trying to... Oh, look at that, look at that. So this was shot with the VR uh, 360 camera. It's a really exciting view of my office. Oops. If it plays, I knew it was asking too much. Asking too much. Well, it's, so it's, what is nice about this one, though, is if you have the so if you use the Firefox uh, nightly or Google Chrome, or it's actually with Google. It's actually called Chromium, the uh, the one that has the, night, the support for the Rift. Which I don't know why they did that. And um, it, this, if you have a Rift hooked up, understands it, and as you move your head around, it, so you can spin around. So that's kind of cool. But if you don't, you can just use the mouse instead. Of course, you can simply watch it load. Anyway, that's what the... In the link. Anyway, we're done.